Lindsay, thank you for uh, for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So I found you on Instagram. You mm-hmm. know uh, Pato Alator, right? I do. I do. Yeah, he's a, he's a good friend. How do you know Pato? Um, we ran this 100-mile race. Let's see, when was this? This was uh, November of 2020, and it was my just the most painful race of my life. And like, I, I have this thing where like, I go out on races, like super fast. I'm like, one of my friends says, it's like, I go out like an eight year old at a 5k, like just like blazing no matter the distance. And so like, uh, I think this was mile like 99, 98. Uh, I mean, I was dying. I was walking at this point, like my back had gone out because the course was just brutal on it. And like, I was walking for like the past, like, I don't know, 12 hours, but I was still so far ahead because I had started so far ahead. And all of a sudden this, like, in my mind, this young kid, because I'm 31, <laughs> this young kid like <laughs> comes blazing by me and he's like, come on, you can do it. And it's freaking Pato, like just <laughs> blazing by me. Did you know and, him before that? Or no, that, that was the only time I'd even seen him that race. Uh <laughs> Cause it's like, it's a loop course. So like, you can never really, uh, it's a six mile loop. So it was hard to, to catch people. Um, so yeah, he blows by me and then, uh, we connected after the race and kind of been friends ever since. <laughs> yeah. He's a freaking savage, isn't he? Yeah. He's awesome. So I think that race, he beat me by like, not very much, but I had him until like 99, <laughs> <laughs> but my back was killing me. <laughs> You're, am I getting this right? You, you, it started affecting you at mile 99. No, no, no. My back, my back had gone out at like mile like 40 because this course was like, it didn't even say that it was, I tell this story all the time. It didn't even say it was a sandy course, but the course was like half sand and like really deep sand that was really hard to run through. And after so many miles, like it really wears on your joints and on, on, on for me, my back and my back just had like gone out at mile 40. So from like, I don't know, I, I at least walked for like, gosh, probably 10 hours. My back was, I, I couldn't even stand up straight. Like there's pictures of me like leaning over because I can't, I can't stand up straight. It was the, like the worst race, but I ended up getting first place for the women, but it was really painful. That's awesome. Jeez. What, what was your time? Was that your first 100 or, or no? No, that was my third one. That was my slowest one. That was 23 hours. Mm. So still under 24 hours. That's yeah. impressive. Jeez. Thank, you. Crazy. For Thank the, you. For the folks that don't know, um, mm-hmm. your background, you've done, you have like 56 uh, races under your belt in like 12, 100 marathons. Is that right? Um, as far as like the, the races that you're probably counting are the ones on like ultra sign up, which is basically mostly the, um, like the, the ultra world or things that are on that website. But I think I'm at, I'm over 60 now. I'm at like, I don't know, close to 70, like marathons or longer. Um, but I've done six hundreds and then I've done some Ironman triathlons and then a ton of marathons, ton of 50 milers, hundred K stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. You don't look like a typical ultra marathon <laughs> runner at all. That's, that's the best part. None of us do like, <laughs> Well, no one, no one looks like, uh, what you picture, maybe, you know, a couple people, but you'll always get passed by people that are like, I don't know, overweight or a old, lot older than you, or like a lot younger than you. Like, it's just like a cool sport because you don't have to look a certain, certain way to, that's, to dominate. That's funny. <laughs> you mentioned overweight too. My first marathon I ran, um, I was going back and forth with these, pretty overweight older ladies yes. like they were uh, <laughs> definitely double my age and they're kicking my ass oh it's amazing right <laughs> uh, so what is um you're battling an injury right now because you stopped running right uh so actually i haven't i've only stopped running for this is like day five and it's killing me but it's just very <laughs> temporarily um so i had a hundred mile race last weekend and i've been battling this achilles tendon issue since the race I was telling you about with the sand. So the sand basically is just so hard for your footing to land. And for me, like, I guess just a weak ankle on my left side. So I had a hundred mile race and I've been battling this Achilles thing for so long. And I ended up pulling at my, this is my first did not finish. Like this is like still killing me, but I had to do it because, um, at mile 65, I pulled, I was in first place overall, like for the men and the women. And like, I had blazed the 50 mile, like I felt 
fantastic. But my Achilles, like with every single step, just felt like it was about to rupture. And I have the Badwater 135 in July. And that's like my dream race. I want to like freaking win it. Like, so I couldn't risk walking another 30 something miles uh, just to finish the race. So I pulled. And so now I'm taking two weeks off just to kind of let it rest a bit. Um, I'll come back probably around two weeks and like do some walk run intervals and kind of just let my body decide when it wants to run again. But we're only temporary, <laughs> temporarily out for like two weeks, but it's, it's killing me. <laughs> what, so what, what inspired you to start doing these? Cause you're in it. You're not just partially in it. You're like, Oh yeah. I'm totally all in, yeah. In it. yeah. <laughs> um, I started running with my dad when I was like a kid. Like I remember being probably eight and me and my cousins would have like races around, uh, Burt Crenshaw park there in Pasadena. And, um, it's like a figure eight makes a mile. And my dad would like have like on the refrigerator, uh, like our standings for the week, like of who out of all the cousins who would win, win the mile race. I was, I was never going to win, but like, I wasn't fast as a kid. And then, so I just started running with my dad after that, always doing like little, like kids fun runs. I played soccer throughout high school, volleyball, all the sports. And then when I was like 17, my dad was like, Hey, you want to run the Houston marathon? I was like, sure, let's do it. It was his first marathon too didn't train you know I think I just turned 18 by race day and I was like I can do this like I'm 18 it's fine (laughs) and it was the most I didn't train it was the most painful thing in my life like I remember being like two days out from the marathon when you're already supposed to have like 20 milers in you know and I remember being on the the treadmill and I ran two miles and I was like well I guess that's good enough (laughs) and um so two miles was my prep and I made it through at like five hours and six minutes for the Houston marathon and which is terrible for uh, you know someone that supposed to run (laughs) but I made it so since then um I would do like a marathon every year the Houston marathon every year with my dad and then when I moved out to LA, I was like, well, people do more than one marathon a year. Like I had no idea. <laughs> and um, so I just started doing like four a year. And then I was like, oh, I think I can go longer. And, you know, I'd already done a bunch of triathlons before, before that, but it all stemmed from running with my dad as a kid. And we still like to run together. That's good. What took you to uh, California? Um, so I've been a model, uh, probably since I was like 13, 14. Um, I've lived all over the place, like Asia, Australia, I was based in Milan for a while. Um, I lived in New York before here. And then I moved out here because I was kind of transitioning more from modeling into like stunt work and the movie scene and stuff like that. Um, And then, yeah, so there was just a bunch of work out here and I was really tired of living in New York City. Just it's not my thing. So I moved out here and then I got on that survival show that I did for Discovery Channel. And then, I don't know, I kind of just, it's never been my passion, but it was always just like, how to pay bills. So here I am. And I, I love LA. Do you worry about, uh, like injury with running, of course, cause then you can't mm-hmm. run, but do you also worry about injury with your professional career of, of modeling and acting? Do you kind of um, worry well, about that? I've kind of like due to that reason, I've kind of stepped away from it, um, a lot just because it's not like running is my passion. Like I want to be able to make running my long-term career. I want to be able to make money doing it. Um, that's kind of like my main focus. So I don't do a a lot of like stunt work anymore. I don't do, I'll take modeling jobs occasionally, but I'll make sure that like, I'm not wearing heels (laughs) for, (laughs) for eight hours. Um, cause I've had foot surgery due to wearing heels before. Um, I, I'm really like stickler with my body. It's not worth it to me to, you know, (laughs) make a couple bucks. What's your ethnicity? Uh, my mom is Hispanic. Um, she's like Spanish and Mexican. Um, my DNA chart says mostly like native Mexican. And oh, then my dad, yeah, my dad is uh, white. <laughs> uh, I always yeah. say, I, you know, you're, you're very beautiful. And my, Thank you. my kids, my wife is white. And mm-hmm. I always say the half breeds make like beautiful babies. So <laughs> they do, don't they? <laughs> Everyone gets mad at me too on social media. Cause I call them half breeds. I guess people don't like that. <laughs> Uh, but we're in Texas. It's uh, it's it's super common. So I think everyone knows what you mean. <laughs> um, so do you coach too? Yeah, I coach running. Um, I started coaching this year, and I like I love it. I've got a handful of athletes now, and they keep me busy. And like as I was running this race last weekend, 
in my mind, I'm like, okay, I need to listen to what I would tell my athletes to do. Like if they're about to rupture their Achilles and they've got like their a what we call an A race in three months being bad water, I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't keep going. Like, listen to what you would tell your athletes, be a good coach and make the smart decision. So yeah, I'm coaching now and it's so much fun. I'm curious. We, we talked to a lot of, uh, ultra marathoners and, mm-hmm. and things like that. And I know your history, you've, you, you've kind of told us that you used to run with your dad, mm-hmm. but at lower mileage. Uh, but how do you get through these big races mentally? Like what, how, what keeps you going a hundred miles? Yeah. I try to tell people, a lot of people are afraid of the pain, but I try to tell people, I'm sure, you know, uh, about mile 15 is where a, a marathon really sucks. Like a marathon hurts, like right about 15, but does it get any more painful than that? No, you just sit with the pain for longer. That's kind of how a hundred miler is like, you're going to go through these highs and lows, but the pain doesn't get any worse. You just have to deal with it for longer. Right. So like a lot of times, you'll just be in your mind and like, I'm in so much pain. But then if you just really stop and you think you're like, I'm not like I can, if I had to handle this amount of pain for the rest of my life, I could do it. So that's what I tell myself. I'm like, okay, you're just being, (laughs) you're just being weak. Like you can handle this pain. This is not something you can't handle, but you go through these, like, I mean, the pain is just a fraction of it. You go through these like stomach issues. You go through, sleepiness you go through like I'm so hungry like your electrolytes go off like you're kind of almost too busy to even really think of the pain because nothing's going right like nothing ever goes right in 100 like you're constantly trying to solve the next problem that you face so you're kind of too busy to worry about like (laughs) how how much pain you're in to be honest do you have a like a routine that you go into mentally or some type of audio uh, script that you listen to, to get you through that? Um, it's so funny. Like in the moment you could probably ask me what I'm thinking of and I could tell you, but after the fact, like I heard someone call it time traveling the other day, like when you run a hundred, they refer to it as time traveling. And I'm like, that's so true because I don't remember what I'm thinking of. And you almost don't even remember the race. Like the next thing you know, it's over. And like, I try to recall like what I was thinking of in certain moments. And I'm like, I don't think I can, you know, like I know that um, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about things, but I think it's truly just thinking of the mile that you're in and how, how you're going to get out of it. Or like, what am I going to eat next? Or what am I going to fuel my body with? Or what am I going to, uh, when do I need to change socks? Like you've kind of got like these things that you have to do, throughout the race to make sure you can make it. So like, or like mentally checking on how's my feet, how are my blisters? Do I need to put on more sunscreen? Like (laughs) you're, you're kind of busy out there. Like your mind's constantly thinking of what you have to do next, I guess. Have you gotten to, uh, have you hallucinated at all on the night runs? (laughs) So everyone asks me this. I have never hallucinated. Um, and I don't want this to sound like, uh, cocky but I've never gone long enough on a hundred like a hundred hasn't taken me long enough to get to that point um but in Badwater I will because Badwater starts it's 135 miles so it's longer um it starts at 11 or for anywhere from 8 to 11 p.m there's different waves mm. so you're already up all day and then you it starts a night start which are I've never done a night start before so you're essentially going to be in the race. You have 48 hours. So you're going to be up for a few days and no doubt I'm going to experience some hallucinating out there. But so far, I am, I mean, like your mind gets a little like, I don't know, but I've never gotten sleepy or, or tired yet. So hopefully I'll be okay for bad water, but I know I'm going to face it out there. It's going to be pretty wild. <laughs> they, yeah. They say that uh, we've done, we haven't done a hundred. We haven't even done 50 yet, but we've done a 50 K. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've done 50 K. So what I hear is that you'll get into maybe not um, like hallucinate, but you get in this meditative mm-hmm. state after a certain amount of miles, like I guess mm-hmm. 30 or 40 or 50 around there. And right. um, the people that just start it, they start feeling that. And then they talk to the other uh, people racing and they're like, are you feeling this way? And they're like, that's exactly why we do it. Cause you, you get into yeah. this uh, and you can think about like your life and, Right. Do you at least get into that like um, higher layer of meditative oh, yeah. state? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think I get into that quite a bit, especially as you do start running um, once it gets dark. Um, yeah. You kind of just zone out a little bit and I think running in itself is purely meditative, but once you get into like 
anything past a marathon, like you kind of have to go into that zone anyway of just like meditating, like out there, like you're, you're so at peace, even though you're in so much pain that it's just like the most beautiful thing. I can't wait until you guys do a longer race so you can truly feel it. And like, cause you said you've done a 50 K I'm truly like, and, a, and a, like hundreds are my favorite, but in a, in a race, mm. the, like up until like the 30 mile point, I'm miserable. I don't want to be there. <laughs> like my mind <laughs> hates it. Um, it. It truly feels like, I don't know, like it sucks. Like nothing feels good yet. Like you're just kind of trying to figure things out. But then once the pain starts, that's when I feel better. Like, I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> it's going to be okay. Um, but like the first 30 miles are just like busy work. But once you get there, then it's fun. <laughs> Are you meticulous about your nutrition or it it almost seems everyone we've talked to that is a super athlete that we've had on this podcast, they don't really, uh, concentrate on nutrition. It seems like that's kind of a, not really a big, uh, thought they eat whatever is available, but it's not like I need to have this one source of food. Are you kind of that same person or what? I'm trying to be more calculated with my running or with my eating during ultra marathons, just because bad water is going to be like, you've got to be sure you're on top of it. But, um, for me, what works best is liquid calories. Like my body is just like completely rejected the gels. Now any, any form of gel, my body's like, no, we're not doing that. So I've been experimenting a lot with like, um, I use Tailwind now, which I've never used before, like the last couple of months, but Tailwind's been really good for me. Um, I'm using this new thing called, it's not new, but it's new to me called Vitargo. And it's like a a powdered starch. So it's like super high carb. Mm. Um, I think it's got like 60 something carbs per scoop. It's pretty crazy. Um, And then, but I'm like big on liquid calories. I love apple juice and Coke and ginger (laughs) ale and (laughs) um, and basically anything liquid that I can get down is best for my stomach. Um, Solid foods are not my friend on the, like, I can't like imagine being like just hot and at like 50, 50, 60 miles. And you're trying to eat like a sandwich. Like, no, (laughs) that's a lot of people do that. They eat like a quesadilla or a burger or something. But I think too, like if you're going a little slower, it's, it's feasible, but I'm by that point, I'm still trying to crank out like 10 minute miles. Like I'm still trying to like run fast. So it's yeah. hard to like, maybe I could walk and eat, but like, I don't, I don't know. Like I, I, it's, it's too hard. So I try and just like do liquid calories or when it gets cold, like if it's cold, uh, chocolate milk is super good at like at night in a race. <laughs> no <It's> way. Really, <laughs> yeah. God, I'll peak that shit up real I would quick. Peak that not not in the end. day, but at night it's like, I did this, um, last runner standing event in December that I won and I was just chugging chocolate milk, like, cause it was cold. It was in Tennessee. Um, and it was rainy and cold and like just chocolate milk. I probably had a whole gallon to myself and it was like, <laughs> but those are slower races. Like last week standing races are like slower pace. Like you have time to stop and, uh, and you know, chug some chocolate milk if you want. <laughs> like it's good. I could see you being a chocolate milk sponsor. A lot of the NBA oh, players. Oh, are... I hope so. Yeah. And it's so funny, <laughs> like in my daily life, like I don't, I don't eat like that. I, you know, I would do like oat milk or almond milk. And then I would, I would never just go chug apple juice, like pure sugar (laughs) (laughs) or sodas. But you know, that's, that's my race of fuel of choice. Anything that you can eat or drink. That's like super quick sugar rush is like the best. What does your daily diet look like outside of racing? Um, I'm plant-based. I do eat fish occasionally. Um, occasionally I'll have some sushi, but I'll never buy it or if it, if just if I'm out at a restaurant and it's an option, I might have some fish. Um, but I eat lots of veggies, lots of fruits. Um, I've, I've tried to stay away from like, like pasta carbs. Like, uh, for me, they cause a little inflammation in my body. So, I'll try and not do like a pure pasta. Um, but gosh, I do love Papa John's pizza. Like everyone knows, like (laughs) everyone knows, like after a long run, like I'm going to get like a large Papa John's pizza and just downing it. (laughs) How long have you been plant-based? Um, okay. So you remember like when the first round of Netflix documentaries came out about food, (laughs) was it like the forks Uh, versus knives or something like that? Yes. Forks over knives was one of them. This was like when I was probably 17, 18, maybe like 2007. And I remember watching them and I was like, all right, sold, but I'd never eaten meat really anyway. Like it wasn't like a huge part of my, my diet. I I do like, even to this day, 
I dream about Texas brisket. Like that's not a thing anywhere else. Like no one does brisket. Like, no. like LA, like, like what's a brisket? I'm like, Oh, it's like a Jewish thing. Like, that's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like no, you don't understand, but I haven't had it in um, well over a decade now. <laughs> wow. And I'm guessing, are you vegetarian or vegan? Uh, vegetarian. Yeah. yeah. I, I love cheese too much. When well, I was Papa doing the survival, <laughs> yeah. When I was doing that survival show, like, Oh, you like you really figure out what you want like to eat when you're being starved um but i could not stop thinking about cheese so it's like i was like i'm never giving up cheese like that is so good <laughs> i guess you're almost close to the paleo diet if you're eating um if you're eating fish right because paleo does they don't do cheese I, they don't do cheese okay i don't know like there's so many different like versions of it right yeah there's paleo and keto i just eat what i like and i eat a lot of it and I don't restrict myself. Like I'm like known for ice cream and chocolate. I'm, and known. Like, I'm, known. I'm known for it. I'm known yeah. for it. Truly. I am like known for, for, um, uh, some sweets. So yeah. you must have a good metabolism. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I do run a lot, but yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> but John and I were getting really into this, uh, blood type diet. Would you, do you know mm -hmm. your blood type? I actually don't like, I have uh, no idea. I should know common. it. It's common. Yeah. We didn't yeah. know it either. We had to look I know, it up. And you can literally like, every time I, I go to this, like, uh, like clinic down the street, like if I ever have like a, an injury, it's like super cheap and quick. And there's always a sign like $25 to find out your blood test. I'm like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. You do but, it. uh, yeah, I need to do it. But I know that my mom, I think my mom follows a blood type diet and it seems to work best for her. We're, we're wondering if maybe you're a blood type because a blood type is not supposed to eat meat a lot mm, and they thrive probably. off of it. And yeah. uh, we're just curious, but we did a, like an Amazon test for it was like eight bucks, eight bucks. You really you prick your finger and mm -hmm. put it on. Send it in. No, yeah. you just, you put it on little, um, like four little circles and then it has like a, a coagulant in it and uh -huh. then you just match it with this thing. It's pretty accurate. Um, oh shoot. So you I'm going to do, it. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. Like okay. five minutes. Sold. Yeah. yeah. Sold. <laughs> I want to know. I want to know if you're a, yeah, I probably am. Cause I don't, I don't crave meat at all. Like I, I hear some people all the time, like, Oh my gosh, I need like a steak. I'm like, Ugh. Uh, <laughs> just, just brisket, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. please. <laughs> I was, uh, I was praying to be O uh, because an O thrives off of a meat diet. I think Mike, you're O, right. Uh -huh. And then, uh, uh -huh. and then I, I tested, uh, it turns out I'm B positive. So I, I read up on B positive and it can eat dairy. So I was like, well, mm. hell yeah, I guess I love, <laughs> yeah. I love being B positive because I can yeah, yeah, chow yeah. some dairy down. Yeah. That's what people like always kind of tell me like, or, you know, or people always have like a, something to say about the way you eat or the way that you do things or whatever. And, or like the way that you run, you're like, Oh, it's bad for your knees. I'm like, look, not every person's built the same. Our blood types are different. Our genetics are completely different. Where we come from in this world is different. Like my ancestors are different. Like what works for me is not going to work for you. And I've never had knee issues. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm generally a really healthy runner other than this Achilles injury. Um, but I always tell people like that ask me like, oh, like how are, you know, your knees are going to give out. And I'm like, look, I'm sure yours are too at some point. Like we're all <laughs> going to end up at the same place. Pick your, pick your path to get there. But I also tell people like, I'm not meant to be like a football player. Like that's not my body type, but I am meant to be a runner. Like I truly believe like I'm like built for this. Like it doesn't seem to bother me. Like it bothers a lot of people. So pick, pick what you want to do, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's very interesting. Do you um practice any mobility work um religiously are you into cryotherapy or ice baths or anything like that i do a lot of massage and acupuncture um i'm actually a massage therapist too so i like oh. I'm, I'm all into massage um but i what comes with that is like graston therapy gua sha um lots of things like that and obviously the acupuncture um, I don't do a lot. I need to get me like a bucket to stick my foot into. I'm not into like the full ice bath <laughs> submersion. Um, but I, I like water therapy a lot. Um, I do, I, I try and do like a lot of, um, I do strength workouts and I've recently added more like mobility stuff to like help my, my ankle out. Um, it just kind of sucks when you're not good at it, you know, <laughs> but I, I'm adding more, more and more by the day, but I used to be like, a hot yoga fanatic and I never got any better at it. I would just liked like to be hot and sweaty and, and all <laughs> that. But but um I don't find myself like enjoying uh 
like yoga or anything like that. But I try and do like shortened, modified yoga for a couple of times a week. This shit these days, the mobility on Instagram is getting a little, it's a little much because they're doing these crazy moves where you stick your leg out and you're, you're kind of yeah. twisting in all these angles. It's like, yeah, it's, so it's like they're just making this stuff up and then you try it and you can't do it and you feel like a loser. No, I know. And then you're discouraged. Like I, there's a great series on YouTube called yoga for runners and everyone should do it. Even if you're not a runner, but there's this girl who's based out of Austin that hosts it. And it's like yoga you can do. And it's like short short yoga it's not like an hour and a half like sometimes like if you'll like google a yoga you know yoga for beginners the girl's like doing the splits with her head like her knees behind her head and i'm like <laughs> what the i don't hell? even know i don't even know how to modify this like, <laughs> there's no modification like, no. no like i can't i can i can barely touch my toes i'm like 5 10 like i can't <laughs> i can't do this but yeah i need to be better at um i'm trying to be better at just like kind of doing some cross training and stuff like that are you into stretching before and after? Um, no, FOMO? no, absolutely oh, not. I, <laughs> I freaking knew it. I mean, you know, like if you read too much into it, there's like, there's all these opinions on like whether stretching is good, stretching is bad, whether it's like making you more prone to injury, whether it's helping, whether it's not, whether you're just wasting your time. And it's like, I don't know, like, again, pick what you like to do and kind of make your routine with it. I think that's the most important thing is like what, what you think is helping keep doing that (laughs) what was your uh what was your best marathon time uh i'm at 307 flat and i'm like let let me tell you it is so hard to train speed and ultra distance at the same time it is the the older you get to the harder it is like it is so incredibly difficult because my my 100 mile time is 1733 which is more impressive than a 307 which is really fast so my 100 times like actually better than my my marathon 1733 that's crazy (laughs) yeah what is that per mile i don't know like like right at 10 but that like includes like you know bathroom breaks and like food and you know that was my very first hundred (laughs) that's crazy (laughs) 10 minute (laughs) miles yeah i was like i love that race um but yeah like but balancing the like the how to like be like I want to sub three a marathon and then I never want to run another one in my life like I just want to like like that might be my goal next year is to just sub three a marathon if I but it takes so much like real speed work like I'm not naturally like crazy fast like I've had to work really hard at it to like qualify for Boston and all that and now I can do it just about every marathon I run but but I had to qualify for Boston back in, I think I qualified 2015. It took me like three years to do it. I did it at Houston, which is, it's an easy course, but it's, it's a hard one to, to BQ at. There's easier courses to do it at. Um, but yeah, I like, I, it took me like three attempts. <laughs> like It was like nonstop speed work. And that's what you have to do. But I was listening to this podcast the other day and they were talking about if you can run a marathon, man or woman about 325 or faster, you have the capability of going sub three and it's just about doing the proper volume and tempo workouts and interval training. And my Achilles hates all that stuff, which is why I'm kind of where I'm at now. (laughs) But I think that's my goal for next year is I want to run a sub three hour and then I never want to touch another road marathon again. (laughs) Like I just want to be done with those. I hate them so much. (laughs) I I know you're, you're coaching now, but Mm -hmm. um, before then, did you have a coach or was it kind of self-taught? I've had a lot of mentors over the years. Like when I lived in Houston, I, um, there's a bunch of like re- obviously really fast road runners there. That's what the culture is. But I don't know if you know the Tornadoes Running Club. It's a Hispanic, mainly male uh, based running club. Uh-uh. But they're all like blazing fast, like Hispanic older guys. And they all took me under their wing and kind of like I trained with them and like <laughs> they're awesome. And they're still like in their like 50s sub three in Houston, like no problem. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you'll see them out at Memorial Park, like just like grinding every weekend. Um, and then since I moved out here, I've had a good friend that like basically is my coach, but we just run together. Um, I've had one coach in my life, like true coach, and he coached me through my first 50 miler. And it was a guy um, who's going to be on my bad water crew, but he um, was also on the survival show that I did. So if you're like in an uncharted territory with anything, I think it's really good to have a coach just to make sure you're not overtraining or undertraining, just to make sure that you're on, on point. 
You want bad water, huh? Is, yeah. Is that a Goggins influenced thing? No. So before before Goggins even existed, there was Is there a guy. time? Is there a time? There was a time. Okay. Um there's this other guy named Dean Carnassus, and he is um the ultra marathon man. That's his he's got a, a bunch of books, but I read his first book when I was uh, about seventh grade, and he talks about bad water, but bad water's been around since like oh gosh, maybe the seventies, like it's been around a long time. And it used to just be like 10 people running through the desert, like, you know, and now it's this like crazy competitive thing to get into. But um, Dean was like the original guy. He was like the original Goggins. Like he was, and he's still around like kicking ass and like doing amazing things. But he, I read his book and I was like, okay, I got to know about this. Like I, I have to do this. And then, you know, you've seen people like Goggins and other people like win the race or do really well at the race and make it more kind of mainstream. But I wanted to do this since I was like 13 years old. Like it's been a, like a dream in the making. You have to qualify for bad water, right? Well, you have to get in. So like you have to have, like there's minimum requirements. You have to have done at least 300 milers, one within the last like six months or something. Um, there's preferred races like the Florida Keys is a preferred race. If you've done that one, I've done that one. Um, it, you have to like, and then, so you can have all these qualifications and then you have to submit and thousands of people submit and they only pick a hundred people. So you have to like, he picks people that he knows can make it through. Cause it's a, it, it can be a deadly race, you know? Yeah. And so he, he picks people that have the resume and that he thinks can, um, there's a panel of people that they think that can, uh, do well there. So <laughs> it's, it's quite the, and then the, the process of getting in is just like, wild and it's expensive and it's a whole thing i think i heard of that race it's so hot on the road that you have to run on the white lines so you're the- i'm sure some people do i've crewed the race twice and it just depends on you know how hot it is like there oh my gosh there's a place called panamint springs and you run like it's like after like a it's like a downhill and it starts to go back up but the ground is so hot it's got to be like 150 i don't know like the air is like 130 and then it's like blacktop and it's just completely exposed and like for sure you can fry an egg like absolutely like that's not a question (laughs) but like yeah and you have to like it's 135 miles there's 18,000 feet of climb like it's a big like a big undertaking we have a a a close friend that's uh gonna do the grand slam have you ever thought Mm -hmm. about doing doing that that series um I've thought about it. I have a few friends that have done it. And then one of my, my mentor coach out here, my friend, he's done what he calls slam water. So he did the, the grand slam and then threw in bad water in the middle of it. Oh, <laughs> so, <geez. Damn. laughs> but um, I don't know, like uh, those races are so hard to get into. I know if you're doing the slam, you have a little bit easier of a, a chance to get in, but as ultra runnings become more popular, these races are like on most of them are on a lottery system. So like I've entered the Western States lottery system for like three years now and haven't gotten pulled, but hopefully soon. Um, a lot of them are a wait list, like all these, those are the big ones, you know, those are like the original hundreds mile races. And those are so hard to get into like Leadville's on a lottery, like they're all on lottery systems. So I think if you're doing the slam, you have a little bit better odds, but what, what do you think separates men and women in these? Cause it, it I feel like, the superstars of the sport are all women and they're kicking the men's ass by a lot. What, why do you think that is? Well, there's science behind it. And I, I read about it all the time, but basically it's, it's, so you've got three types of muscles. Essentially you've got your fast twitch, your slow twitch, and then like your combo. Um, most men, I mean, all the time men can, can beat women at marathons and have better times because they're, their fast twitch, their explosive muscles are much better and more, they fire better. It's just science. Like that's how it is. And, but as you get into these longer things, when I'm running a hundred mile race, I'm not using that fast twitch muscle, even though a 10 minute mile is fast to some people, it's not that muscle group. It's more of the slow twitch muscle fibers that can last forever. So women don't need that explosiveness in, in the longer the races go. And then there's also something called your glycogen storages, which is basically how well your body starts stores carbohydrates and fat. So you have glycogen in your muscles and in your, your fat systems. And from what I understand, women can store more of it than men can because of the fat content of their body being higher. So the longer you can go, 
using your glycogen storages, the better. So mm. women are just better <laughs> long distances. <laughs> um, but also like women are known to be better with pain because obviously childbirth and things like that. So I think women are able to focus more on the task at hand instead of the pain that comes with it. But there's true science on it. Like, I think the longer the distance past the marathon point, women tend to close the gap on on it. Maybe they're not better by science, but there's no no longer a gap once it hits like the 100 mile mark. I'd be scared to be her boyfriend <laughs> and piss her off because there's no getting away from her. No. I, would, I could never like run, run that long. Or playing listen, chase. Listen. I would hate playing oh. chase with you. You'd, like, listen, I live in Hollywood and like, I don't know if you've ever been to Hollywood, but it's a little sketchy around here. And like, that's like my main thing. I'm like, all right, you can just run. Like you can just run away. <laughs> I'm good for a hundred miles at a 10 minute pace. Yeah, I can get I anywhere. Dare, good luck. I, I dare you to catch me. Yeah. I almost wonder if the, so the glycogen storage that, that has to be closely related to childbirth too, because you're storing all the extra energy to give childbirth too, right? Is that? It's something. Um, and there's obviously a lot more science to it than what I understand. But from what I understand, the main, I mean, there's many factors, but a lot of it is being able to store more fuel in your cells uh, that you can access whenever your body's depleted mm. kind of thing. I yeah. feel like you belong in Colorado. What's up with that? I don't like the cold. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Do you prefer like the the environment in California over Texas? To be on. Okay. So I'm in LA. LA is so similar to Houston. People like, don't believe me. I'm like, it is <laughs> like, there's the similar, like Hispanic influence culture. Um, the weather, I mean, it's not humid here, but the weather is very warm and like really nice. Um, the people are very similar uh, the the city is very similar as far as like traffic and it's a big city but LA is so cool because like I'll be up in the canyons like climbing you know way up there and what city in the world that's like this big can you go like climb and get lost for like 40 miles right in the middle of Hollywood like that doesn't exist like elsewhere yeah. like LA is so cool obviously there's like different like political sides and everything but like LA is like, it's such a great place. It's a little crowded, but I mean, so is Houston. So is Austin now, even like mm. Texas is like being way overrun now. So everyone from California love, is coming this way. I know. I mean, it is expensive out here, but you pay the price for like literally perfect weather year round. So what about that <laughs> Texas charm? Do you get that in, in, in California? I always hear people in California. I don't think are rude. So. Um, no, I don't find that people here are rude, but I, there's like, there's only a few states in the country that really have that, like that pride. Texas is one of them. Like Texas is for sure one of them. And I still have it. Like, I'm like, I'm from Texas, like <laughs> first and foremost, I don't identify as a, a Californian, but I do like where I live for sure. I, I love it out here. It's really, I mean, you, you literally, like, you can't, like, I don't have to check the weather. It's not going to rain, like, <laughs> 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 but in Houston, like. That's a, like a bad thing about when I was living in Houston too. Like I would sign up for races and I'm like, there's like a 90% chance I'm going to get rained on like, yeah. or have a weird cold front that comes in like, <laughs> the, you know, but here it's like, it's not going to rain. You're fine. Like <laughs> it's going to be fine. Is your, uh, is your dream to stay in California for the rest of your life? Or do you eventually want to come back know. to Texas? I could probably come back to Texas. I don't know. I, I just like it out here It's for right now. And, and it's fine. And I don't, really see myself moving away anytime soon so yeah. i like it yeah. Can, i mean and, and i get to run trails out here like yeah. there's no like the trails in texas are just flat trails you know although I, I, yeah i've done the the rocky raccoon 100 miler there in huntsville and you know there's still not a lot of climb but i mean at least it's a trail yeah it's it's mostly pavement running especially around here in houston we live yeah um in the Pearland area so there's, okay, there's, yeah. there's no trails here <laughs> it's no all there's not exactly yeah so you kind of like i don't know i've loved learning how to run trails here like that's like the best part about running is is getting to experience different terrain and all of that and there's no way i would be able to even think about signing up for any of these races you know, like the Western States or anything, if I was living in Houston, like you need to be able to run elevation. Yeah. Are you allowed to talk about the ultra documentary that's um, yeah. being worked on right now? How did you get involved with that? Um, the, the two filmmakers reaching uh, that are making it reached out to me and I am the youngest one in Badwater this year. So they wanted to follow my story. Um, 
and kind of see like, you know, my journey through it. And so uh, me and a couple other people are film or, you know, being the ones that they feature mainly, um, but they'll be out there for the race and they're going to film the whole thing and all the meltdowns and all of it. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have a, a camera crew following you daily or I mean, following your workouts. What does that look like? The, they're done now. So they're back in Europe. They're, they're two mm. filmmakers from Europe. So their plan is to try and follow like one or two more people in Europe and get their story. Uh, Cause there's a lot of international runners that are coming to do bad water. But um, so that we filmed for at least a month recently um, at the beginning of the year, they filmed workouts, they filmed races. Um, we did a bunch of interview B-roll, all of that stuff. And then they'll come back later in June to get like the, like the prep uh, of how to prep for the race. Um, the crew that's coming to help crew me. And then they'll be out there filming the entire race as well. Awesome. I can't imagine they're like running with you. <laughs> Maybe it's so funny. The one first of, five one, miles or something. Yeah. Or, I'll see you one the, the <laughs> No, they're going to be in a car, but that it, it brings a whole different challenge to them too, because it is hot out there. Like they were like, well, we'd love to give your crew a GoPro, but the GoPro won't be able to, to stand the heat. Like it'll, it'll what? shut down. Yeah. It's going to be like your phone shut off. Yeah. It's like, so they've got to make sure they have like equipment that can withstand like that much heat at one time. But it's funny. One of the guys, David, he, he's great. He's from Belgium. He like got interested in running, like as we were doing <laughs> like filming wow. and like, he's a smoker, you know, he's a European guy, just a smoker. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we got him to run with us one day and he's actually great, but he like comes out and he's in like these like really slick, like, like street shoes and we took him on a trail and he's like sliding everywhere <laughs> <laughs> but he did he did great but uh yeah i'm excited they'll be back out to film so this is your it's your second time and that's you were being filmed i guess and it's going to be on the discovery channel right this one um i forget what the, this one I, I i'm not sure exactly which this one will be on um I know that they're shopping it everywhere. I think okay. Netflix had some interest, um, oh, wow. but yeah, the, yeah, they'll be trying to push it as far and wide as they can. It's done really, really well. There's not a lot of documentaries done on on Badwater. Um, the race director uh, wants to make sure it's you know done in a good light um, because it is a dangerous race, but you want to show that it's not like <laughs> that that people are safe, you know, doing it. Um, and I think that they are, but you want to make sure that the filmmakers are showing it in the best light. So I don't think that many filmmakers get press passes to film there. Wow. Are you yeah. a little worried that you won't finish on film? No. no. Oh, golly. <laughs> no, I'm finishing that race. That doesn't, <laughs> I've only not finished one race and it was last weekend due to prepping for bad water. So <laughs> I just, I had to make sure that um, I'm healthy for bad water. So. I'll so, so I love confident. it. Confident, jeez! I love, I love the confidence. Awesome. And honestly, you have the time. Um, you've got forty-eight hours. Um, only a few women have ever gone under thirty hours, and I want to go under thirty hours. So um, nothing is going to go according to plan, obviously. But I would love to win. I would love to go under thirty hours at the same time. Is, so we'll see. I can't. I haven't done the math, but what what gets you there with ten minute miles? Oh, 10 minute miles are probably impossible there. Um, it's so much climb and it's uh, too hot. <laughs> but my friend did it when I crewed him in 2019 in 29 and a half hours. And I think that was like a 13 something pace. Jeez. So, wow. yeah. Dang. So what does your crew look like for this? How many people do you have following you? I've got four people. My dad's one of them. Um, so my dad will be like my, what we call crew chief. He'll be like the main guy. Um, then I've got my friend Myra, who I grew up with in Houston. Um, she is a runner now. And then I have uh, my friend Gordon, who trains out here with me quite a bit. And then my friend Adam, who was on the Discovery Channel show with me uh, doing the race as well, carrying me. That's awesome. Are, yeah. are you allowed to have somebody run with you too at some point? Yeah, you can. After mile 42, you can have uh, a pacer, but they're not like there's so many rules. They're allowed to carry all your stuff, like your water and everything like that and food, but they have to run behind you because of safety. Like they're not allowed to run in front of you. They're not allowed to run beside you. It has to be behind you. So they're not like pacing you, but they're keeping you company, keeping you moving, kind of thing like that. That's awesome. Adam, Yeah. Ad is Adam an ultra runner? He is. Yeah. He's a uh, professional. Yeah. What's his last name? Kimball. Mm. 
Yeah. I, know, I know an ultra Adam too. I can't think, I can't think of his last <laughs> it's a good, name. It's a good ultra name. <laughs> yeah. Common ultra name. <laughs> yeah. There's like a bunch of Adams. Yeah. 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 Well, Lindsay, I greatly appreciate your time. Uh, of course. We know you have a busy schedule. So um, how can people follow you on Instagram and follow your journey through Bedwater? Yeah. Follow me on Instagram. It's just my name, Lindsay Phoenix. Uh, it's on private, but that's just to keep some weirdos out. So feel free to hit the request <laughs> button. I'll accept it. Um, uh, you can, I'm not very active on Twitter, or Facebook, but Instagram is a good spot. Um, if you're interested in coaching, I will coach anyone anywhere. Um, I coach people that are walkers all the way through ultra marathoners. So you can, uh, there's a link in my bio if you're interested in coaching. Um, but yeah, the, the documentary, I'm not sure when it'll be out or anything like that, but they also have a page it's called ultra, the documentary, I believe, um, go check out their stuff, follow it, um, support them. They're really good people. Awesome. Well, yeah. we'll definitely get on that and we'll be cheering you on. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> and I can't wait for you guys to do a hundred miles. <laughs> oh, we're going to try one of these days. We're going to do it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay. You have a good day. Thank and, you. Uh, good luck on your training. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.